Hello everyone, I'm back. It's been a hot minute, but I am back. I have this wonderful Amazon package that I figured I'll open for you. Uh, this isn't really a, an official walkthrough or flip through or even a haul video. This is just me giving you something to look at while I kind of like talk about <laughs> the past few weeks and how my exam went. Oops. And uh, um, yeah, so let's bust into this bad boy. Make sure I'm not going to cut into anything. So I just got back from Massachusetts. I am tired. I look ratchet as all get out. That's another reason why I, um, I'm not appearing on camera and that's a really loud car or motorcycle driving by. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, but yeah, so I flew up to Massachusetts a few days ago to go up to my university up there and defend my um, my last PhD exam. And it was a great experience, but I'm exhausted. Um, but basically what I'm showing you guys today is just some things I got for myself uh, to treat myself to celebrate the fact that I passed my exam uh, with high honors, apparently. Um, so for the last three months or so, I've been reading, reading, reading for my final exam. This is my major exam. So, well, actually, let me back up. <laughs> let me back up even further. So, in general, for most PhD programs, at least those programs that I'm most familiar with, which would be uh, PhD programs in the humanities, at accredited institutions like state and private universities, but not-for-profit universities. Um, you basically have a few years of coursework at the beginning, like I had two years of coursework. And then while you're taking courses, you are, you might already be teaching like working as a TA, a teaching assistant, or a teaching fellow, or something like that. Um, doing the dirty work, like grading the papers and organizing materials for a professor, or in my case, since I'm in a language program, teaching a foreign language to undergraduate students. And then after a year or two of coursework, then um, you usually have a year or so to take some sort of exam. Um, and each department and every university kind of does it its own way. And then after you pass your PhD exams, you, um, you basically write something called a prospectus, which is a kind of a rough outline of what you think you're going to do for your dissertation, the kind of results that you expect to find, a rough outline of each chapter, that kind of stuff. Um, for example, my prospectus, or for my dissertation, I think I'm going to write just a four-chapter dissertation, but each chapter is probably going to be roughly 50 pages. And... Uh, and then there'll be an intro and conclusion. So I estimate that my dissertation will actually be around 250 pages, which is the norm. Um, my partner's dissertation, he's in a completely different field, but his dissertation was also uh, around 250 pages if you include the bibliography and the work cited. And um, he also had to have extra materials in, his, um, in an appendix section. Um, so, yeah, so <laughs> I'm explaining all this because I had, like, extended family members and friends of the family and stuff who saw that I, I posted on Facebook when I passed my exam, both on my personal page and on my student witch page. For those of you who follow me on social media, on Facebook and Instagram, you saw that. Um, and thank you, those of you who, who reached out and said congratulations. I really appreciate it. It was a big accomplishment. Um, it, it's a big deal when you go from being a PhD student to a candidate. 
So now I'm officially a candidate, which actually opens the doors for a lot more fellowships and grant applications and job opportunities and whatnot. So anyhow, what was I saying? Oh, so these extended friends and family members and people, they were congratulating me thinking that I had actually finished my PhD and I had to correct a few people saying like, no, I, I just passed a candidacy. I still have to write the dissertation. So I still have another 250 to 300 pages to write. <laughs> In the next, oh, I'm guesstimating three years. I'm hoping to give myself three years um, to actually be done and defend the dissertation, hit the job market, and all of that. So, um, yeah, I on Monday, April 30th, so right around the time of Beltane up here in the northern hemisphere, I had the oral defense and I got amazing feedback um, my, the professors that I'm working with, uh, including my advisor and another professor that will be in my committee. I'm going to have two other professors in my committee, but I started off with these two for the exam. They're really excited about my project. Um, my advisor was telling me the next day I had a meeting with her to talk about the perspectives and what to, whoop, what to expect and all that. And she said that my project is really cutting edge in my field and um, that I'm ready, I've been ready for this, I'm a good writer, and that there's actually, well, I don't want to get too much into it, but really, she gave me some really great advice and um, really great news about how promising my research is and how that'll help me for when I hit the job market. Um, so... It was amazing, uh, but I am exhausted. <laughs> After months and months of studying, and then I had basically 48 hours to write my heart out, to answer a question and write an essay. I wrote 26 pages, which doesn't sound like too much, but for really intense like academic writing, heavy in research, and you're trying to pull all these different sources together to try to answer um, answer a question, an essential question about the nature of your field that you're specializing in and how it's changing and all that. Writing 26 pages in 48 hours is a lot. <laughs> and then immediately after I turned it in, I had to fly up to Massachusetts. And while I was in Massachusetts, I was socializing a lot. and. I'm a natural, just introverted person, and I need my personal space. I need a break to myself every once in a while to, like, chill out and charge my batteries. But I was staying at a friend's house, so I was already in someone else's space. And, you know, I was sleeping on an air mattress in the living room, so I didn't really have any privacy. And on top of that, I had to go to a birthday party, and I had to do this defense, and hang out with people, people of course who I wanted to see, but I'm, I'm just, oh my lord, I'm appreciating having the house to myself right now, because my husband is, um, he's giving his students their final exam today, um, so I have a few hours to myself, and I was able to sleep in, and just take it slow, and I'm giving myself the rest of the week off, um, so, let me take a break from life updating and just share with you what I have going on here. Let's start off with the tarot, of course. This is the Golden Tarot by Cat Black, actually um, by US Games. Uh, I actually don't know much about this deck other than um, the couple of flip throughs that I've seen. Um, but I was attracted to this deck because the artwork reminds me of some of the research that I'm going to have to do. <laughs> Even though I work mostly in the contemporary period, um, I, the nature of my dissertation, I, I'll be making bridges between the early modern Renaissance period and colonialism with the contemporary and sh kind of showing how some systems of power and relationships that were set up um, in early colonial times are still affecting us today. So there's this kind of time traveling aspect to my dissertation, which I'm really excited about. But uh, 
the artwork in this uh, deck. It says here, the Golden Tarot is a compilation of collages from artwork of the late Middle Ages and early Renaissance. Right? Uh, poignant images of gentle beauty and human frailty come from a time of violence, pestilence, and oppression. Amen. <laughs> I would not want to live. I mean, I'm so thankful I was born in the late 20th century and not in other time periods, you know? <laughs> especially as a woman. But anyway, these images speak to me of a truth that is timeless, of hope that flowers, even the darkest conditions, it is my hope that they speak to you as well. Okay, so these are collages. These aren't exactly medieval or late medieval and early Renaissance art pieces. These are actual, um, these are collages inspired by them. But the artwork I, I just fell in love with, especially the devil card, which we'll see here in a second. And it really reminded me of some of the time periods that I'll be working with with my dissertation. So um, I'm actually thinking about using this deck uh, to help me through the writing process of the dissertation, specifically when I'm working on those past time periods, like late 15th century, 16th century, and into the 17th century. I have a lot of stuff going on back then. So, um, yeah, but the... The deck is just gorgeous. It had a really good price on Amazon. I know this isn't like a new, fresh off the press kind of deck. Yeah, this is from 2003. But the artwork, I just fell in love with. I was kind of vacillating between this and the Golden Tarot Visconti Sforza remake deck. I can't remember who did that, but it comes with a kit and a book, a guidebook talking about the history of the Visconti Sforza deck. And I figured, you know, eventually someday I would like to invest in a, you know, um, a copy of that deck since it is such a historical early deck and blah, blah, blah. But I ultimately decided for this one because of the devil card. So, um, yeah, if you just look up the Golden Tarot by Cat Black, you will find all sorts of flip throughs and people sharing this deck and they'll go into more detail about it than I am right now but the box is great the guidebook looks nice and chunky with lots of information about the cups so each suit it looks like and each card has a little page for it and I hope that she kind of goes into I can't tell but I hope in her descriptions of the cards, she goes into the actual artworks that inspired her to put together the image for that particular card. Um, it doesn't look like it though, but that's okay. It's mostly for the feel of the deck, why I, I got it. So it comes with these two little extra cards, the title card, and then this little explanation about the creative process. And I love the backing of the deck too. I just love the, the feel of this deck. Um, so as I, maybe I'll zoom in so you can get a, a little bit better image. And I'll go into the books that I got too, don't worry. I'm just kind of rambling and I figured y'all would appreciate having something to look at. <laughs> so before, um, before finishing, uh, my exam. I had all sorts of plans for the summer and unfortunately things when it comes to my partner um, his visa situation we still don't exactly know what's going down. Um, he, We still haven't heard from a lot of the job applications. We don't know if he's gonna have to go back to Chile uh, Sooner than later, we don't know. Things are still up in the air. <laughs> um, but I had all sorts of plans over the summer. Exciting plans when it comes to my Student Witch channel and content. Um, I guess I, um, I started putting together a website for myself. <laughs> Just to like let the cat out of the bag. Um, and this website, it's a free platform. I mean, I'm not putting together a website because I'm thinking about starting a business or anything like that. I don't have time to start any sort of witchy kind of business. Um, I actually 
started it, and I will go into this in further detail when the time is right and when I actually <laughs> finish building the website. Um, I started this website as a way for me to have a blog, and I specifically wanted a blog to force me to write um, because I have some issues with perfectionism and perfectionism for me stems from well I'm not gonna get into it here but I mean perfectionism and uh, imposter syndrome are really common in academia because academia um, especially in PhD programs and when you're at a, a level one R1 research institution the pressure is on like the pressure is real <laughs> So, perfectionism, procrastination, imposter syndrome, these are very real issues and very common issues. And so I figured, um, and well actually, let me back up, I've, I've been actively and consciously working on, actually I love this strength card, I love this image back here, the crow and this horse charging towards her and the lion. Um, there's a lot going on in the strength card. I love it. But anyway, oh, and the hermit with the deer. Oh, and the kitty. And the bird. Anyway, I actively started working on my perfectionism and working on where my perfectionism comes from. And I'll get into more detail about that when I make a video about it as part of my Witching Through Grad School series. Um... Earlier this semester, I started focusing on this because I knew that this exam was coming up and after the exam, even more writing will have to happen. And I don't, I, I don't want any sort of perfectionism to get in the way of me making enough progress and timely pro uh, progress on my dissertation. Um, so... I wanted to create this website and a blog to give me a space to sit down and write and to write out some of my ideas. Of course, I'm going to have to be very careful about what I share of my research on my blog. I will, of course, just as I do in my videos, I will tie in what I've read and, you know, the the knowledge I've had the privilege to have access to because everything's tied together for me, you know, my witchy practice and my spirituality. Oh, this is a beautiful image of death, actually. I love it. You still have the, the skeleton here, but it's a very peaceful kind of image of death. I like that. Anyway, um, I will, of course, tie in research and give reading recommendations and talk about um, the development of different ideas and what ideas that I've I've learned about in academia and how they tie into my spiritual practice and then um, my witchery even but I'm not going to directly talk too much about my dissertation project because one thing my advisor warned me about is that oh here's that devil card I talked so much about I love it ah and I think this is actually a pretty famous image having the face and the abdomen and all what that kind of represents between like mind versus body and you know the transcendent versus the earthly lower level physical existence and all that kind of stuff so um i don't know if this is in uh Heronius bosch or am i mixing that up if whoever knows what inspired Cat Black to make this card and this specific image of the devil? Comment below. It's not coming to mind right now because my mind is just fried. <laughs> but um, I love this devil card so much. <laughs> it's so creepy. And it speaks a lot to uh, actually my research. Um, anyhow. I'm going to have to be careful with what I share of my research online and in other places because academics, if, you're, if they learn about something that piques their interest and your research isn't published yet, they will steal your shit. And that actually happened to my advisor when she was a graduate student. She submitted a paper on a Dominican performance artist 
um, that wasn't very well known or studied and the paper wasn't accepted because she was just a graduate student, but somebody more famous and more important than she was at that time anyway, um, stole her idea and got away with it because her paper wasn't published. So I, I'm not going to directly talk too much about my research, but I will talk about my resources, the things that I have access to, the theories and things like queer theory and feminism and transnationalism and uh, transnational feminism <laughs> and how all that kind of comes together in my spiritual practice and in my research and in who I am as a human being. So I am super excited about that. I had plans to publish my website in May this month, later this month, and to start uh, actually a newsletter for June or a, a monthly newsletter beginning in June. But <laughs> plans might have to change because um, my advisor wants me to get a draft of my prospectus into her by the end of June. And she also wants me as soon as possible to write a draft of one of my chapters. And this chapter, it it won't be too hard for me to crank out pretty quickly because it's kind of based on research I've already done and research that I've already published. But still, um, preparing a prospectus and getting that underway while also writing a chapter in your dissertation at the same time because she wants them both in by the end of June. <laughs> it's going to be kind of crazy. So I might have to push back my plans about uh, the monthly newsletter and mon like making a commitment to monthly blog posts and all that. But I'm going to try this month in May to get that website up and running. I just have to make some final touches and finish some of its content but I'm super excited to get more of my voice out there and to share more of my ideas again keeping in mind that I have to protect my my research projects um, and my identity but I'm super excited because I, I really feel like this is what I can contribute to this community the access to the specific types of knowledge that, I, that I've had um, and my outlook and my voice like I've in the past few months as I've been working on my procrastination I've also been working on um, confidence and having the confidence to know that this community um, and the people who just naturally stumble upon <laughs> my content, whether it's on my YouTube channel or eventually on my website, I think people can benefit from it. Um, I think I have important things to say, things that are worth reading and listening to, if, if I may be so bold to make that claim. Um, and I think also because my, I don't think being a, any sort of a tarot card reader or any sort of like a witch and making my own business I don't think that's my calling my calling is academia like after my advisors feedback on my exam and my research um, that she was telling me about a couple days ago like I am on fire about finally being able to produce my own research and get this dissertation underway I feel like I've been ready for this moment for <sighs> three or four years now actually I just had to jump through a bunch of hoops to get here but I I am I have wanted a PhD since I was a teenager um, and no one in my family has ever gone to college much less gone to grad school and gotten a PhD so I don't know where that desire came from but this is what I'm built for I'm really good I'm a decent or a pretty good writer um, the ideas that I'm putting together for this PhD, for this dissertation, are important ideas. Um, and 
I've been told by people who have observed me and people who've been in my classes that I, I have a very calming and open presence in the classroom and that um, the type of information that I, I teach or I will teach eventually, it's important. Um, so that is how I think I can best contribute to <laughs> both humanity in general but also to uh, to the the witchy pagan community that I'm in um, that I most of the time consider myself a part of is by by being a teacher um, the teacher archetype is very important to me and very prominent actually <laughs> um, it is an archetype that has taken me a long time to see that it's an, it's an important part of me. It's something that I, I identify with. It's one of the many hats that I have to put on, but it's a very important, powerful hat, and I have a talent for it. And so I'm hoping to use my blog as a way to disseminate information and to teach people, people who are interested in it, of course. I'm not going to force anybody. I can't, you know. It's, I'm just a very small person on the big, wide ocean of the Internet, right? But I, I am so excited to be able to share my experiences and my ideas and um, a little bit of the research that I, I might be doing and um, contribute to the community in that way. So my blog and having access to my blog, everything I plan on doing is will be free. Um, and I hope to foster organic community engagement um, you know whoever might stumble upon it or wishes to keep up with it you're welcome to you're welcome to make comments on it when it's finally published and I'll make a video officially you know uh, you know officially telling everybody about my my website for those who are interested but I I'm just so excited and on top of being excited and on top of being able to share my ideas and um, a little bit of my research and all that and contributing to this community in the way that I feel is right for me. Uh, on top of all that, it'll be a great space for me to practice my writing and to practice putting some of my ideas together in relation to witchery and in relation to my spiritual ideas and spiritual practice um, and to help me kind of overcome my perfectionism because my perfectionism almost always manifests itself when it's time for me to write, to sit down and write. <laughs> and it causes me to lose time, it causes me to procrastinate, it causes me to get stressed out and full of anxiety. And I'm just tired of it. And I don't, you know, when I'm working on this dissertation, I'm not just going to be writing the dissertation, I'm also going to be filling out grant applications and fellowship applications. And anybody out there who's applied to a grant or a fellowship, you know, that that shit takes time. It is time consuming writing all those personal statements and research statements and getting letters of recommendation and sending in transcripts and this and that. And like, good lord, it's intense. <laughs> So that's very time consuming and then later on in the process when I'm getting closer to finishing the dissertation it'll be time for me to hit the job market and hitting the job market again when you send in those uh, job applications you have to send in your, your CV and personal statement and research statement and teaching statement and letters of recommendation and all this crap so I'm gonna be busy and I'm not going to have time to have like a little mini meltdown and freak out about writing this one particular paragraph in this chapter or whatever. Like, I need to get the work done. And if this website helps me overcome a little bit of that uh, perfectionism, then all the better. I mean, it's a win-win. It's a win for me. It's a win for those who are interested, <laughs> who might be interested in following me or reading my blog and whatnot. Um, so I'm, I'm really, really excited about that. Um, I'm really excited to get into working with this deck because I'm just falling in love with this deck. Oh my lord. I love the artwork in this deck. Love it. Um, so yeah, that's what's going on. 
<laughs> this is me rambling. At least I'm giving you something to pretty, something pretty to look at. Um, my brain is fried. It's been an intense couple weeks. I'm so glad it's over, but I'm also a little bit stressed out about what's coming <laughs> because my original plan was I didn't think I would have the first chapter done until later in the fall, like closer to November and December, but my advisor seems pretty confident. She thinks that I'm going to be able to get it done by the end of this summer. So if she thinks I can, then I think I can, I hope. <laughs> Um, I'm just going to be super duper busy, but I'm giving myself the rest of the week off. I'm making plans for my next set of 12 weeks for the 12 week year system that I, I struggle with, but it, you know, overall it helps me. I just struggle to keep up with all the tasks for my 12 week goals. But anyway, for those of you who are familiar with the 12 week year system, um, so I'm putting together my 12-week year system, and my next set of 12 weeks starts on Monday, May 7th. I'm going to hit the books. I'm going to do a lot of research throughout the rest of May, try to take advantage of having access to the university library here in Georgia while I still can before any major moves might have to happen, either at the end of the month or at the end of the summer. Hopefully not, but, you know, that's the reality of our situation. Um, and just be as productive as possible before I have to move abroad because moving abroad is going to be intense and it's going to be time consuming and I'm going to lose time actually so if I can have the prospectus definitely passed and if I can have a chapter or even two chapters done of this dissertation before I move abroad that would be excellent that would be very very good for me so that is the goal. The question of when we're moving abroad, that's a completely different story. <laughs> that is still very much up in the air. But I'm really excited about the research that I'm going to be doing while I'm down there. It's going to be very important research and, like my advisor said, pretty cutting edge. Um, it's going to be, it's going to help me when I hit the job market, for sure assuming I do a good job with it. <laughs> so, yeah. Oh, are we almost at the end of this flip through? Yes, oh, look at the queen of coins. That's gorgeous with the coin here. This deck is just so beautiful and I love the backs too. So, so beautiful. Well, that was a quick little flip through of the Golden Tarot by Cat Black. I got it for around 24 bucks on Amazon Prime, which was really nice. Comes with this little thing too. I don't really know what it is, but there you go. Now, let's talk about the books. So while I was up in Massachusetts, excuse me, um, before I left, I went to one of my favorite bookstores and in the used section, let me zoom out first. Ooh, that's the opposite way. There we go. In the used book section, I found two really amazing looking books. Um, basically, originally, before I found out that I would have to possibly try to produce both the prospectus and the first chapter of my dissertation by the end of June, <laughs> my original plan was to take the month of May off and just take it easy and just read, just do pleasure reading. And I've been doing a lot of reading well, not a lot, considering how busy I was this past semester, but I've been doing whatever pleasure reading I could, mostly in the form of audiobooks, um, about Buddhism and meditation and mindfulness, because I also put that into practice. My goals were to establish a daily meditation practice, um, that didn't work out. I just couldn't keep up with that. I was too busy, but I still was able to meditate at least three or four times a week. And even that I can tell has made a huge difference. Just somewhere between 10 and 20 minutes, but depending on how much time I had that day, sat down on a pillow in front of my altar, meditated, and oh my Lord, it has, it's been a game changer. It's been really helping me, um, in all sorts of different aspects of my life. And also reading about Buddhism has been very interesting um, and 
I'll have to get into that in further detail later on down the road. But all that being said, um, I found this amazing book, Meeting the Great Bliss Queen, Buddhists, Feminists, and the Art of Self. And look at that cover. Oh my God. This is by Anne Carolyn Klein. And she is a professor. She has been or was studying, I don't know if she's still alive actually. This book came out I think in the 90s, let me see. I got it for 10 bucks, because it was in the used section. Originally this was printed in 1995, um, but this is a reprint from 2008. Okay, so Anne Carolyn Klein is a professor. I'm assuming she's still alive. <laughs> she has been studying Buddhism uh, specifically Tibetan Buddhism, and even more specifically, the type of Tibetan Buddhism that the Dalai Lama and his order belong to. Um, I don't know much about Buddhism. I'm very much still a very beginner. <laughs> um, but, um, so she is a specialist in Tibetan Buddhism and various different kinds of Tibetan Buddhism, but specifically the order that the Dalai Lama belongs to, right? She's been studying it since the 1960s. She's traveled to Tibet. She's practiced and learned from different religious leaders in Tibet. Like, this woman knows her shit. But she is very open about being a white woman, which I appreciate. Um, and she talks about it in this book about white Western women in Buddhism. And... Specifically this book, as you can tell, Buddhist Feminists and the Art of the Self, she um, talks about how Western feminism can benefit from some Buddhist ideas and practices like mindfulness and the understanding of the relationship to the mind and the body and how that can overcome that, that mind-body Cartesian split, which I talked about in my last video. Um, so this has been very interesting, very, very interesting. And the Great Bliss Queen is a Buddha, um, a woman, which according to a very uh, one of the types of Tibetan Buddhism, it's not the one that the Dalai Lama belongs to, it's a different one. The name escapes me right now, but it's the oldest form of Tibetan Buddhism. It starts with an N in English, I can't remember what it's called. But anyway, there's a historical or mythical historical figure of this woman from the 8th or 9th century who um, basically rose to Buddhahood. She, she is revered as an enlightened being, um, which apparently isn't all that uncommon in Tibetan Buddhism at least. So she's referred to as the Great Bliss Queen, which is amazing. And so and Carolyn Klein, the author of the book, is using this great bliss queen as a way to kind of open up the dialogue between Western feminism and Tibetan Buddhism. And so I'm, I'm kind of in the middle of the third chapter still. I started reading this uh, in the airport when I was flying back yesterday. So, so fascinating. I, I can already recommend this book if you're interested in those two realms. <laughs> Um, see if you can get your hands on a copy. It's so fascinating. And then I also found for $8 the Logos of the Living World, Merleau-Ponty, Animals and Language. And Merleau-Ponty, I've, uh, I've kind of been exposed to some of his ideas. Um, he's a French, I believe. I might be making this up because, again, sorry, my mind is fried after going through this whole process with this exam, but I believe he's a French post-structuralist um, theorist, or is he actually a psychoanalyst? I might be mixing him up with somebody else, but anyway, he doesn't directly have anything to do with my research that I do, but I've been exposed to him kind of vicariously through other researchers and authors that I've read throughout the years, but this is specifically about the relationship between humans and animals. I love the cover. I love ancient cave paintings and ancient art. Oh my lord. <laughs> As evident by um, my matron deity, which I've talked about on and off throughout throughout the channel. But anyway, um, so this is specifically about 
the, that fuzzy line between what counts as human and what counts as animal and the ethical implications of that, I believe. Let's see. Here we have a little blurb on the back. Today we urgently need to reevaluate the human place in the world in relation to other animals. This book puts Maurice Merleau-Ponty's philo philosophy into dialogue with literature, evolutionary biology, and animal studies. In a radical departure from most critical animal studies, it argues for evolutionary continuity between human cultural and linguistic behaviors and the semiotic activities of other animals. So that's really cool. So it talks about the human-animal relation through language, which is really, really interesting. So for eight bucks, I couldn't say no, so I went ahead and got that. And then just now, in the Amazon package, I got this book, The Miracle of Mindfulness by, oh, I'm going to butcher this, Thich Thich Nhat Han. He's a v Vietnamese, very well-known and renowned Vietnamese Buddhist. Um, I think he was actually in exile during the Vietnam War, and he knew Martin Luther King. He might have even been nominated for a Nobel Peace Prize at some point, but he has lots of books for Buddhism, or about Buddhism, and mindfulness and meditation, but for a more Western audience. Because I believe he came to the United States while he was in exile because of the whole Vietnam conflict and all that. Um, so this is going to be probably the second or the third book that I've read in the past few months about mindfulness, but the first one by him. Because I also have his book, The Heart of Buddhism, which is kind of like an intro book about Buddhism which I started reading months ago, but I, I haven't picked it up, so I'm going to have to start rereading it again. But I'm really excited. So, uh, yeah, just an introduction to the practice of meditation, which I'm really excited about getting into. A day of mindfulness. It looks like it's going to be a really quick read. And I really like how he writes and uh, how he keeps in mind that he's talking to a Western audience. Um, oh, that's a beautiful image. So yeah, I'm really excited about that. I'm really excited about the future publication of my website. Whenever that might come, you'll know because I'll make a video about it, announcing it. Um, I'm really excited to engage more with this community and share more of myself, or as much as I safely can, anyway, <laughs> with this community. Um, through the website and my blog, but also through, you know, the YouTube channel and all that, and Instagram and whatnot, and I'm really excited about diving into this tarot deck. Super excited. So yeah, that has been my life for the past few weeks. It's been almost a month since I published a video, so I figured I'd get on here and uh, share some stuff and share the things I got myself to treat myself, because I fucking deserve it. <laughs> Anyway, until next time, many blessings. Bye!